All right, so let's get started for real. So this is a tutorial with a whole bunch of people. It's not just me. It's Rob Sherwood, David Erickson, Hideyuki, Srini, Murphy, a whole bunch of helpers, six people, in addition to about 10 from Stanford that I'll introduce later. So this is only possible with help from a lot of people. So you heard who I am from Asena. Who are you? So Asena sent me uh, an Excel spreadsheet of everyone's title. And I decided I'd have a little fun with it, point out some uh, curiosities. So first off, who is in this room? Well, here are all the companies that have at least three people. This is from an earlier version of who's going to be here, where there are 129 people. There are around 160 or so now. So these numbers have actually increased, and the rankings may have changed. But we have people from HP, Cisco, Juniper, Huawei, Brocade, ZAO, Google, a lot of big companies here. Plus, and I thought this was the most interesting bit, over 60 companies that have at least two people, or that have two people or less. So there's not just depth from a few companies. There's a lot of breadth to interest in software-defined networking. So a few more details. Decided to look at some of the titles. We have engineers, senior engineers, principal system engineers, distinguished engineers. And my favorite at the bottom, I apologize if this is your title, senior technical marketing engineer. I don't know what that means, but I'm curious to find out. <laughs> we also have plenty of academics, ranging from the lowest students to the highest professors and everyone in between. We have CTOs, VPs, founders. And then a few other, uh, again, these are titles I don't fully understand. I'd love to learn more about. Solutions architect, cloud architect, chief tech expert, and just chief. <laughs> All right. So let's start out with some goals. What do I want you to learn? The overall goal is to get you to think critically about software-defined networking. I want you to know what the pieces are, how they fit together, how you can use them, and how you can build on them. So the focus is not just the hands-on going through exercises. That's actually been demoted from uh, past tutorials, which used to be OpenFlow specific. It's now generalized to thinking about software-defined networking, to thinking about that whole architectural vision and the pieces that make it happen. A few more specifics. So I want you to know what these are, how they relate, what's available now, and more, more importantly, SDN and you. I want you to know how you can use it I want you to know how you can build on top, and I want you to know how you can build something new. And the hands-on tutorial later will help with that. Having world-leading controller authors, some of the first ones, talk about the systems they've built, I think is really going to help out. Hearing deployment experiences, hearing Rob talk about virtualization, I'm going to cover all pieces in the SDN stack. If there's a question you have, let us know during the break. We'll be happy to answer it. And in fact, during the hands-on session, if you don't have your hands on at all, that's fine. If you just use that to ask us questions, that would be just as useful. And have fun. All right, so here's an agenda. 9 to 10 o'clock, I'll be talking. We'll assume that you don't have any experience in SDN, but ramp up pretty quickly to some interesting, juicy technical details. 10 to 10.30 is going to be the SDN stack, part one. The lower side switches a little bit of the controllers. The upper side, the applications, virtualization, those are going to be Rob and I talking from 10.45 to noon. And then after that, 1 o'clock is, I think, going to be the highlight for me, which is hearing the controller authors and maintainers talk about their systems, followed by hands-on, and then finally, deployment experiences with Srini and a bit of a wrap-up. All right, how did we get here? Well, to understand SDN, I think it, it helps to understand the history. And history isn't all that complicated. It's not that long. So here are some historical motivations that are largely from the academic research world. So this is a slide, slightly modified, from Nick McEwen. And this is a slide that kind of came out around 2007, 2008. And it's a perspective on the networking industry. It says, here are things that are broken. So you look inside a box, and you have millions of lines of source code. OK, that's not so different than the computers we use every day. Tons of RFCs, seems pretty overwhelming. This creates kind of a high barrier to entry. You have to implement all of those RFCs on the checklist to be considered a real vendor to sell products. And a lot of that is because everything has to interoperate at the node level. You're buying something, that hardware has all the software with it. You can't just add stuff on top after the fact. Also, the, the packet forwarding hardware is getting pretty complicated. It's billions of gates. 
Now that number isn't any different than what's on uh, a complex server chip. But these things are pretty complex. They're getting to be more power hungry. And what's hard is that a lot of these complex functions are baked into the infrastructure when really they should be just defined at a higher level. So examples are things like OSPF, BGP, multicast. A lot of these things kind of push functionality into the hardware. And a lot of SDN is about giving you new ways to use that hardware or pulling that functionality out of the hardware and defining it more in software. So you combine these things and you get an industry that largely has a mainframe mentality. And by that I mean vertical integration. I mean Cisco and HP and Juniper. I don't mean this in a bad way, but more of a kind of factual thing. They will sell you products that, go, that cover the entire stack, kind of like Apple is today. One problem is that there's little ability for the, the non-telco operators to get what they want, to push the standards, to do a, a data center specific version of what they want. And that's encouraged a lot of companies to just go off on their own and build the products they want that are customized to their needs. And I think this last sentence really sums up the way things work, which is that functionality is defined by standards. It's baked into hardware, and then it's deployed on nodes. And SDN actually changes every one of those three pieces. So one phrase that people toss around about the networking industry is ossification. So what does it mean? Well, if you look it up on a dictionary online, the natural process of bone formation, a natural hardening over time. I think this is a little more of a, a harsh phrasing, but I actually agree with it. And that's a tendency toward or state of being molded into a rigid, conventional, sterile, or unimaginative condition. This is a really harsh criticism of the networking industry. I don't mean to say that everything's broken, but there are things that we could do better. And that's what you should take away. Another problem, research stagnation. Again, circa 2007. If you look at all these other areas, you can find plenty of examples of deployed innovation where you could do new things. So an example is a file system is a new thing. A scheduler is, is a new thing. Virtualization is a new kind of functionality. Uh, distributed systems, distributed hash tables, new functionality. MapReduce, that's new functionality, new interfaces to the system. Same thing with compilers. We have all kinds of new languages. But you look at networks, and they largely do the same things, just faster. So it's not that they're better. It's that they're faster. And I would say that the rate of change seems kind of slow in comparison. So one more problem. I won't dwell on the problems too long. We'll spend the rest of the time on solutions. Is that vendor hardware is kind of closed. And what this means is, number one, if you have an idea, you can't add that idea to the system you buy. Now, this is changing a little bit, and some vendors are opening APIs, but at least in 2007, 2008, when these changes started to happen, when this realization came about, that wasn't entirely the case. Other thing is we're kind of stuck with the same interfaces. So if we have some different idea of what a switch should do and how we should get instructions to it, we don't have a way to communicate that unless it's entirely buildable from the interfaces that we've already uh, been given, that have largely been defined five to 10 years ago. And the sum of all this is that it's hard to meaningfully extend the products you buy, and it's hard to meaningfully collaborate both within industry as well as in academia. So open systems are one way around this problem. We can modify them. So what are some options? Again, this is the research perspective of I have an idea. I want to deploy it at scale. I want to take that algorithm, and I want to make it, I want to show you as close to reality as possible why it's a good idea and push it to its limits. So we could use simulation. We could use emulation. We could use software switches. We could use software switches and connect them up on a bunch of hardware, maybe scale that up. Uh, NetFPGA is an example of reconfigurable hardware. Uh, network processors are another way. But really what we want are vendor switches, because they have all of these characteristics. High performance fidelity. We can scale them up really large. We're not limited to ports like with NetFPGA. We can do real user traffic. Complexity, at least for us, if we configure them, is not as bad as building any of these things ourselves. But that openness is, is kind of the key problem. So how do we get open? openness in the devices we use. So there's a gap here, and none have the desired attributes. So ethane, this is Martin Casado's PhD thesis, and it was a SIGCOM paper in 2007. So the way ethane works is pretty simple. Host A wants to talk to host B. First packet from host A goes up to a flow switch. That packet goes to the controller. The controller makes a decision based on whether host A has authenticated and whether host B has authenticated. 
So if it knows who's trying to talk and it knows that that communication is valid, it says OK and it pushes down flow entries. So for each switch on the path, each of these dotted lines, the controller will send down a message that says, allow this communication to take place, matching these header fields forward things that line rate from now on. And this was created with the initial observation that a simple thing like having a switch where two hosts can't talk, so a default off rather than a default on network, is impossible today buying an Ethernet switch, uh, unmanaged Ethernet switch. There are ways to do it with management. But a simple piece of functionality that should be there, that you should be able to change it to, wasn't easy. And there was a realization, uh, this was Nick McEwen, Scott Schenker, Martin, that the dumb and simple switches that just happen to be part of uh, the design of Ethane might be more broadly useful. And OpenFlow is what came out of that. Literally, it is the dumb, simple switches from the Ethane project, given a new name and new people to push them out and get them into the hands of researchers. And it has a lot of nice properties. So it's, it's trying to be a pragmatic compromise. It's trying to be something that doesn't uh, take all the, the control away from the vendors, but still gives researchers some hooks to do new things. So it has the speed, scale, and fidelity of vendor hardware, flexibility and control of software and simulation. More importantly, vendors don't need to expose any of the internal implementations because it's kind of a least common denominator interface, a simplified, abstract, single flow table, effectively what you would get in a TCAM. And it leverages hardware that pretty much everything has today. There's some limits. Uh, TCAMs are expensive. It's a list that you look up that allows wildcards rather than just exact match entries. Um, so there may be some table size limitations. But OK, so here are some of those limitations. That least common denominator interface gets in the way, limited table sizes. Uh, one big thing is that switches just aren't designed to work this way. They're not designed to have many messages per second from an external controller. They're not even designed to send a lot of data to anyone over TCP. They're mainly designed to configure a forwarding table through protocols that they know in advance. And another thing is there are new failure modes to understand. If a switch and a controller are decoupled, well, what happens when that connection breaks? What's the correct behavior for that switch? All right, so more details into how OpenFlow works if you're not already intimately familiar with them. It's kind of simple. You start with an Ethernet switch. You peel it open. You'll see something like this, a control path, a data path. OpenFlow is a feature added on top of the data path that, that kind of sits alongside the control path. There's an OpenFlow controller outside. And what OpenFlow defines is the protocol between the two. So it does two things. It defines a messaging protocol, and it also defines semantics for modifying the state of the switch. What do those messages do when the switch receives them? And who can send what in what order? So here's an example. Uh, actually, I think it makes sense given Ethane, so I'm just going to skip through this one. All right, so here are a few more details. The interface to OpenFlow are these three tuples of rules, actions, and stats. So the rules can match on some given set of fields. And this set of fields seems to change with every version. It generalizes to more things, like uh, IPv6 support is recently added. When it started out, it was almost entirely IPv4. And layer 2 through layer 4 pieces of information plus the port, which I think is layer 1. And there are all kinds of actions we can do for all packets that match a given rule. So one is we can forward a packet to zero or more ports. We can drop it if we want to be like a firewall, or we can forward it to one or multiple. We can encapsulate the packet and send it to the controller if it's an exception, if it's something that the controller should really see and act on in a more reactive way. We can send it to a normal processing pipeline. This is kind of an interesting action because it assumes the existence of a regular Ethernet switch or IP router or some other functionality on the box that you want to interoperate with. You can also modify fields. For example, an IP router would rewrite the destination MAC address for the next top. And any extensions you could add, it defines a format that allows you to add these things. And then finally, we have stats for each rule. We have packet and byte counters. So here are a few specific examples of how you can use those rules to implement functionality. All right, so destination-based Mac learning and switching would be ignore everything and forward on a specific destination Mac address. Send out a specific port. Flow switching is the opposite. It's push down a full end tuple where we define every field and only if everything matches. So flow defined as these tuples should the uh, packet go out that port. 
We also have a firewall action. This would be integrated with the others. It's an action that says drop, maybe before or after. You can do things like IP routing, where based on the destination we forward, and this could also be a subnet. Openflow supports that. And then VLAN switching, it's not just the MAC destination like layer two, but it's also the VLAN ID. And that might even be send out multiple ports. All right, easy enough so far. Most people know about Openflow at this point. Openflow is not enough. It gets you part of the way. So here's what I mean. Openflow adds this ability to modify, to experiment, to build on top of the systems that you buy. But it's still really hard to add features to a network. And the reason is you're effectively programming. It effectively gives you assembly. So nobody here programs in assembly, right? OK, maybe a few people do. Raise your hand if, if you have programmed in assembly or you do. OK, we have a few people. I've programmed in assembly. It's useful, right? You get direct control of that hardware. Anything that hardware can do, you can do. It's not exactly true with OpenFlow because it's a slightly abstract interface. It's not the exact instruction set supported by hardware, but it's a common denominator that everyone can agree to support because TCAMs are so ubiquitous. Now, OpenFlow is just a forwarding table management protocol. That's it, and it's one example, and there could be others. So why is it hard to add a feature to a network? Well, the first thing is it's not just that we lack access to line rate forwarding that we can control. A lot of it comes down to the algorithms we can implement and how we implement them. So how did the internet develop? Distributed. Each node is responsible for their own domain. There are different relationships between those domains, like peering, hierarchy. It's great if you want to incrementally deploy and you want a failure of your neighbor to minimally affect you. I mean, there's some exceptions to today's internet, but that's the idea, that you add fault tolerance by allowing parts of the network to die. But the problem is fully distributed algorithms are really hard to build. You have to worry about all kinds of consistency issues and safety issues, and things like route flaps are an example of when you don't fully understand your control system and you don't have, uh, you don't have a state that is consistent that you can trust, problems can happen like loops, temporary loops, or disconnections. Also, your protocol must implement its own mechanisms. So if you have an idea for a slightly modified version of a protocol, maybe you can add it within that protocol, but maybe you want something different. Now, most protocols need to discover the topology. They need to have a, a, a guess of who's connected to where or what are the links. And upon that graph, they need to operate. But we can't reuse those mechanisms because everything is defined at the protocol level. Another thing is your algorithm, which is already hard enough to build, because you have to implement your own mechanisms. You have to implement a fully distributed algorithm, which is much harder than centralized, much harder to test especially. It must work on constrained and heterogeneous resources. Imagine if you had a program that you had to run, and it had to work from the smallest netbook or phone to the largest server, and it had to be the exact same protocol. People would say you're crazy. So this is where software-defined networking comes in that we need a control plane abstraction as well. All right, so from OpenFlow to SDN, first off, what does software-defined networking mean? Well, the earliest I've seen this term come out is an article from Technology Review. This is March or April 2009 by Kate Green, who had written this article. And at that time, it was an article describing pretty much OpenFlow, but not the SDN we know today. It was separation of data and control allows you to do new things with the control. That was it. But actually, SDN and the ideas behind it go back much farther. They go much earlier than 09 or 08 when some of this stuff was, was happening. Things like the 4D architecture that splits up IP routing into multiple planes, routing control protocol, SANE, Ethane. These are all new ways of, these are all ideas that influenced SDN that showed that there are new ways to architect the network other than fully distributed, eventually consistent protocols that we have today. All right. I'm going to give you three views of what is SDN. And if you disagree with any of these three, I'd love to, to chat about it. I think this is uh, an open area. These are going to be a little bit abstract, and I'm going to give you something more concrete at the end as we get closer to 10. So the first one is what I call the McEwen view. And this is SDN is refactoring functionality. So define SDN by its placement of functionality. Where are the things that implement functionality? So today we have closed boxes, fully distributed protocols. By now it's familiar. Each of those boxes has a set of features, uh, the little beige things on top of 
an operating system on top of specialized packet forwarding hardware. And the McEwen view is that SDN is an approach to open it that pulls these features out of the hardware, pulls the network operating system, the apps out, and puts them on top of a layer. So it effectively abstracts and separates them. And the software-defined network is defined by an open interface to hardware, at least one good operating system, ideally open source, on top of which apps can run that provides communication primitives for the hardware and configuration primitives for the hardware. And third, a well-defined open API, ideally to where you can add your app or add an app that interoperates with someone else's app. Now there's an extra layer that you might add, and Rob, Rob is going to talk about that later today, and that's a virtualization or a slicing layer. So you can imagine having multiple network operating systems, just like today we have multiple operating systems running on top of shared hardware through things like VMware or VirtualBox, which you're going to use, um, Zen. With apps on top, maybe these apps are communicating. This is another way to structure that functionality that has some benefits. All right, so that's view one of SDN. It's all about refactoring functionality. And this, uh, one of those benefits is that it allows slices. It allows a network operating system to see a subset of the network. All right, so option two, or this is what I call the Schenker view. Who here was at the last open networking summit? Raise your hand now. Okay, so we don't have too many people. We have, what, 160 or so here, and I think I saw six hands? That's good. So I'm going to give you a highly abridged version of what I think is the most useful presentation you can watch on SDN. And you should go watch it, not through the Wi-Fi here, but at some point later this week. So the Schenker view is about redefining abstractions. And the idea is to define software-defined def networking by the abstractions it provides to software as well as the people writing it. So what do I mean? So OK, here's a link to follow. Uh, just a quick note, all of these slides will be up by the end of the day, but we're going to put them up after the talks so you pay a little more attention. All right, so this was one of the keynotes at the last Open Networking Summit. And so a lot of these bullet points I'm going to talk are compressed from his uh, Scotch talk. So here's the gist. Networking control planes need abstractions. The abstractions we have today, so abstractions, the benefit is that they solve architectural problems and they enab enable evolvability. One of the problems is we can't evolve our network easily in stages because we have all this, this bag of protocols that don't have structured ways of interacting. So today's layers, like layer two, layer three, are great abstractions for programmers that want to build applications on top and just think about getting transport at the data plane, but they're terrible in terms of control interfaces. So they don't assist the, the people building control software and the creation of their software. And there's a really interesting point, which is, that networks work because we can master complexity, because we can train people to follow CLI guidelines, we can teach them the complex workings of protocols. But actually, maybe this is not the right approach. Maybe networks should all be plug and play. They should be much easier to manage. They should be much easier to build. And one way to do this is to extract simplicity rather than master complexity with the right abstractions. Some examples would be a stick shift versus an automatic transmission, or a command line interface versus a GUI. One is going to be much easier for most people to use, and in many cases, that is the right interface, even though, at least as engineers, we can typically master that CLI, or we like the control we get from the, the manual transmission. So Scott makes this observation that programming has made a transition, starting from machine languages, where you had no abstractions, which is where we are today, to higher level languages. Operating systems are an abstraction. They give you files. They give you virtual memory. They give you data structures. OK, well, some data structures. But higher level languages are mainly to give you data structures and ways to compose programs. We're starting to enter that phase of SDN. Modern languages is where we are today in the programming world, where we have even higher level abstractions. Right? Python is a pretty high level abstraction. That code looks a lot like pseudocode. And there are a lot of languages like that. And there are even higher level languages. I think of MapReduce as an example of an abstraction that allows you to program efficiently. Things like objects, garbage collection, all these things got added. And abstractions simplify programming because they make it easier to write, maintain, and reason about these programs. So here's the question you should be asking yourself. 
can and should networking follow the same path of higher abstractions for the implementation of the control plane functionality? All right, so Scott's abstraction number one is a forwarding abstraction. This is something we need. We have an existence proof in OpenFlow, but we don't necessarily have the right answer. So this is forwarding behavior specified by a control program. x86 is one way to do it. It's really general. It's hard to analyze. Uh, it's not easy to support in every platform and not easy to do efficiently, but it provides a way of thinking about how we can forward packets. Another way is MPLS. We get a path and we get labels to match, and that's our interface. That's our forwarding abstraction. But you can imagine modified versions of OpenFlow that aren't message-based. Maybe they use RPC. That's a different interface. Or maybe they abstract the hardware differently. It's more a description of the forwarding resources rather than an abstraction, a single flow table. All right, the second piece in Scott's talk is a state distribution abstraction. And the idea is that a control program shouldn't have to distribute to handle these distributed state details. In other words, a higher level description of what needs to happen, the, the functionality mapping, um, the state of the world to the outputs should be handled at a lower level automatically in the same way that programs can trust that they're going to get a file from the operating system. And his proposed abstraction is a global network view. A control program operates on this network view. Its input is a graph, and its output is a configuration for each network device. So this is the network operating system, the same one as from the McEwen view. So the short version is programs that operate on graphs. And the third abstraction is even higher level, and we don't have this today, and we're not exactly sure what it means, but I think it's a really interesting direction to go, which is a specification abstraction. So the idea here is to give a control program an abstract view of the network. So to say, here is an abstract network. Here is a, an abstract graph that doesn't correspond to the physical graph. Maybe it's a single node, really simple graph, upon which you can define optimizations. Like, I want a, a com, uh, joint optimization for the cost it takes me to send my packets and the power it takes me to send them. Or I would like to provide connectivity between these users, and that's all I say. I say, do this. And the system below implements that on whatever hardware I provide with an optimal implementation. This would be really cool, but we're not there yet. But SDN gives you a way to, to get closer to this. All right, what is SDN? This is the last option. This is my view, which is that it opens up design axes. So the idea here is to define SDN not by what it looks like or how we think about it, but by the flexibility it provides. And since SDN opens up these design axes, there's all kinds of new stuff you can do. I'm going to talk about that. So my definition is that an SDN is any network that gives us the flexibility to choose between design points on the following axes. And I think this is a more general definition than the other two. So let's get into specifics. One axis that SDN gives you is centralized versus distributed code, uh, control. Centralized is one controller, or maybe it's three controllers in a Paxos cluster. Maybe it's a small number of, maybe it's an active uh, standby where you have two, or maybe it's active standby where you have three controllers. I still consider that centralized control. It doesn't necessarily mean you just want to have one controller for your network. That would be a single point of failure, and that wouldn't be particularly smart. Distributed control is, for every node in my network, I have at least one control element for that, that node. So every switch has a controller, or a small number of switches share a controller. And the controller's talk is peers. OK, another axis you get is microflow versus aggregated. So layer two switching is, is not quite microflow, but it's a finer granularity. Uh, layer three routing is, is aggregated. It's prefixes and ranges of prefixes. And each approach has its advantages and disadvantages. So with the microflow, there's this cost to set up a flow, or there's a cost to push down a set of explicitly defined, very specific communicating um, pairs and the exact headers that match those. So these typically use exact match flow entries. Those are cheap because they can be implemented by SRAM rather than, um, they can be implemented by uh, yeah, SRAM and DRAM pretty cheaply compared to TCAMs, which have to be on all the time. They're effectively caches. They consume a lot of power and cost a lot of die space. So microflow is really good when you have policies that are fine-grained, that are changing on a short time scale, or that you want to apply in a really fine-grained way, like on a campus. Now, aggregated is the opposite. It's you want to manage a bundle of flows 
which gives you a way to manage them pretty efficiently. This is great for a large number of flows like in the backbone. All right, axis three, reactive versus proactive. Now, many people think that microflow means reactive and it doesn't. Actually, these are orthogonal axes. So proactive means pre-populated, means we push things in advance. Reactive means we wait until an event in the network happens, and then we act on it. So with reactive, it might be the first packet of a flow that triggers the controller to insert entries. With proactive, it's a controller that's pre-populating everything. And the advantage of proactive is you don't have to wait. Your forwarding just happens, and it happens at line rate immediately, and there's no delay based on the traffic pattern. Um, loss of control connection generally doesn't disrupt traffic. That's pretty nice. But it does require these more expensive aggregated rules and the mathematical operators to handle them. Reactive. The advantage that I like is that it has extremely simple fault recovery. It effectively can be implemented entirely with soft state. So if a switch in your network dies, you replace it, you start it up, you point it to the controller, and then everything just happens. There was no state that you needed to really synchronize. It starts with a, uh, an empty table, and as events start happening, those packets go up and everything starts to, to populate, almost like a process that gets switched out, repopulating its cache. All right, another axis is virtual or physical, or virtualized or physically implemented. So physical to me means you're running on a separate hardware switch rather than something like OpenV switch or the switch inside most uh, virtualization software, which is entirely defined by software. So there are, no, there are no dedicated hardware resources for the forwarding there. Now, the advantage of doing an SDN using physical control is that it gives you really good control over forwarding resources. Uh, the disadvantage is you may be stuck with what that hardware provides. So virtual gets you away from that. If you want to define a new operator, you want to operate on a random bit field on the data of a packet, you can totally define that. And if you run everything in a virtualized environment anyway, then there's no extra cost for this since you'd already have to send your packet through the hypervisor anyway. And since you have a CPU that's changing every, that's doubling every, what, 12 to 18 months, you get a lot more processing power, whereas you have to wait longer time scales for your switch CPU, and it's also typically going to be much lower provision because it wasn't designed to handle lots of processing. So virtual gives you all these advantages in terms of what you can do and the complexity of the things you can implement. And then the fifth axis is fully consistent versus eventually consistent. I hinted at this earlier. So with fully consistent, you have certainty about your state. So an application knows the state. With eventually consistent, it knows that it will get that state eventually. And the alternative is inconsistent, where there is never a guarantee that two control programs operating on that same graph or operating on the same network will ever come to the same conclusion about what state really is. Inconsistent state tends not to be very useful, so I'm just looking at fully consistent and eventually consistent. So if you have fully consistent state, as in the full set of flow entries in my network is this version, and I transition to this other version, and there is no in-between, or my virtual machine is on this physical machine, and now it's going to be on that physical machine, and there is no in-between, then I know the full state of my world. And it's much easier to analyze that way. I don't have to worry about the ordering of events. Eventually consistent, however, is much easier to scale, especially when you have distributed nodes that are far apart trying to agree on decisions. And if you're calling a friend and just agreeing who's going to talk first, if you've called someone in another country, there's that communication delay, and it can lead to confusion. So here's a picture to think about these axes, to think about what SDN gives you. Five axes, left and right. Today we have BGP. I think this is a great example for everything on the right side. It is distributed. It uses aggregated state with IP routing. Actually, it's even higher than that. It's prefixes and, and business rules. It's proactive. It does everything in advance rather than reactive, reacting to individual packets. It's physical. It doesn't really do much on virtual switches, even though I guess you could implement it BGP on a virtual switch. And it's eventually consistent. It gives you no guarantees about how quickly you're going to converge. It just tries to do a good job most of the time. This is a good choice. So many of these choices arrive from assuming decentralized administration in the beginning of the internet. Now, these axes for ethane are pretty different. It's centralized, microflow-based. It pushes down these very specific rules. It reacts to packets, it's physically implemented, and it's fully consistent. Oh, well, uh, it's kind of fully consistent. So the, the controller has a, 
so this is a good point. Uh, it's kind of fully consistent that the controller has a view of the world, but that view may be a little bit skewed going into uh, the switches. So from the switches view, it's eventually consistent. They eventually get that data from the controller through their control channel, but the, the controller thinks it has fully consistent state, and in a sense it does. Eventually that state will come in. But it's, it's bounded time to push all the entries down, so I think it's closer to fully consistent. Actually, maybe we could drag that bar over a little. And a lot of these choices pretty much came out from thinking, let's administer things centrally. Now, what is this one? What is hetera? It has dots on both sides. Actually, this is the case. It implements functionality using both. And this, I think, demonstrates why SDN is so cool. Because before, you had to pick. And now you get to pick anything. And you can mix and match. And you can do whatever makes the most sense for that specific application on those specific resources doing what you want. So Hetera is a data center routing protocol or data center manager. It operates on mesh-like structures called fat trees or close networks. And it provides routing within that even though the links in the core of this network may not be significantly faster than the links at the edge. So the problem there is if you have two senders going to one destination or and you hash packets randomly, if you get a big elephant flow and a big elephant flow on the same link, they each get half the bandwidth. So Hetero tries to solve this problem. And the way it does it is it allows these little tiny flows to go random directions. It does ECMP routing, equal cost multipath. Send them a random direction, get it there eventually, don't care how. Use a simple hash on the packet fields to determine which path it is. So flows will all take the same path over time, but different flows will take different paths, and the mixing will be roughly even. Well, the problem, again, is when two elephant flows collide, you have a problem. So Hetero tracks the flows. And if a flow gets really big, it decides, I'm going to make a centralized scheduling decision, shift it through a path that I know is, is lightly loaded compared to others so that we don't have this collision. It's centralized in that there's this fabric manager that's doing central decisions. It is distributed in the sense that those decisions are, are pushed down to nodes. So it's a hierarchical distributed system. It has centralization at the top and its distribution below. There is a controller for every switch in this network, but there's also a master controller that sits above. Another one is microflow. It, it uses microflows uh, to track the individual flows to get statistics on them, and the local controller sets those up. But in a sense, it's working on aggregates in that it randomly chooses where things go. Uh, Hetera is reactive in the sense that as a flow bandwidth increases, it triggers an event that causes the fabric manager to decide where to reroute that flow. It's proactive in the sense that it pushes down a default route for every packet to the controller, uh, to the local controllers, which make a, a really quick decision. It can be virtual or physical. I mean, this is something you can implement on the edge switches. And in fact, the Portland protocol below Hetera, which it's based on, explicitly ch divides up the Mac space into virtual machine identifiers and switch IDs and then a few other fields. And it has a mix of fully consistent and eventually consistent state because, again, that protocol below, the Portland protocol, is ensuring that when switches start up so that you don't have to configure anything, they find their place in this network. And so uh, every switch's ID has to be fully consistent because you can't have two switches with the same ID or everything would get confused. But it's eventually consistent in another sense, which is that as de decisions come from the controller, they eventually get implemented. So a lot of these depend on Whose view is it? There's an NSDI paper that has some more details if you're curious about that one. So what is your SDN network or application going to do? And I would say it's going to be some mix. It can be both. It can be something kind of in the middle. It can change based on the current conditions. This is the flexibility you have that you didn't have before. It sounds like I'm hammering a point home, but that's kind of the, that's the point of today. This is what you can do with SDN. And now we're going to start to give you more and more specifics about how to make this happen and what those pieces are. All right. Some examples for using OpenFlow. So there are all kinds of applications that benefit from this flexibility. And a lot of these benefit from the flexibility in ways that aren't obvious in hindsight. So the first application was more secure networks that are off by default for Ethane. And then it became, oh, maybe we can do better wireless routing, better handover, if I have a central view of what access point my, hand, my phone or my laptop is connected to so that when it moves, I minimize that disruption. I reroute the flows directly. 
So that's wireless mobility, and you're going to see a demo on that in the second session. Also, virtual machine mobility. Well, one way we can do, one, one thing we can do, and this is one of the first applications of OpenFlow, was to move a virtual machine not just across the hall, not just from a building to a building, but across the Pacific. You'd think IP routing prevents you from doing this. And well, yeah, IP routing does. But if you treat your network as a flat, layerless thing, where you can do anything with the flow entries and anything with the, the header space, as long as you translate at the edges, the ingress and egress points of that network, you're fine. You're good to go. You can use the network however you want. So mobile VMs was kind of a, a cool example. I think this was 2008, where Dave Erickson, who's going to talk later, showed how you could get a virtual machine moving across the Pacific by using OpenFlow islands connected by tunnels. And this was without, without the uh, virtual machine stopping, without it. I mean, there's just a temporary pause, but not stopping entirely, and getting assigned a new IP address, which would break all the existing connections. Some other ones, network virtualization. Rob will talk a little bit about that. Power management is my thing. That just wasn't an obvious thing that you would do with a network if you had this flexibility. That one took Nick by surprise. Uh, another one is, this is a Stanford demo, which is hardware. So how do you connect pieces of hardware functionality, like a video encoder that needs to then do something else in a pipeline? Well, one way to connect these is through OpenFlow. It provides a plumbing mechanism. That's one way to think of it, rather than a way to run your network. And then things like load balancing, you're going to see a video on that. Uh, functionality as in dedicated boxes can be pushed into the network itself if you have that control. And then things like traffic engineering in the WAN. Well, you have these bundles. You can do what you want. And then all kinds of others. So the ones I mentioned are just at Stanford. They're the ones that I'm the most familiar with. But there's a much broader set now. So our network admin was most excited by removing spanning tree. This is kind of, kind of simple, but kind of a deep insight that our networks today waste capacity that if we had smarter control and the ability to change that control, could do more. Things like network visualization, being able to access that state easily, what traffic is going where, gives you a better way to see a picture of what's going on in the network. Uh, another one is network debugging. Well, how to use the state to more effectively debug. It gives you some more options rather than kind of poking at the edge or looking at aggregates in the core with things like NetFlow. Even other ones like packet circuit convergence, which is how do we mix the control for an optical network as well as a packet-based network? These two things have very different control protocols, but if we can merge them, then maybe we could reduce the operational burden for telcos. And then th even things like home networks, access control, and building, using uh, cheap boxes to build the functionality of larger boxes and, and kind of scaling them through software rather than building a backplane. All right, so what SDN really means is kind of up in the air. So here's a definition if someone asks you. Software-defined networking is a refactoring of the relationship between networking devices and the software that controls them. This actually comes from a solicitation for hot SDN, which is a, a workshop coming up in August. And I think this is nice because it doesn't say anything about the implementation. It just says how we should think about it, a relationship between the devices and the software. 